And good morning, everyone. We are so glad you are here on this Memorial Day weekend, more importantly, on the Lord's Day to come together and to uh, worship God. Uh, so thank you for coming out this morning and joining us here at North Citrus Christian Church. We welcome all of you in person. Don't you love that? There's a term we never even used like four years ago. Uh, but now all of a sudden we have to say in person. Or those who are joining us online, uh, we welcome you as well. Uh, of course, we're right here off Elk Camp Boulevard, uh, nestled between Citrus Springs and Pine Ridge. And we love to have you come visit with us 1030 uh, every Sunday morning. Um, welcoming you this morning, uh, let's take a look at the bulletin. Several things happening here that we want to tell you about. Uh, first of all, if you are visiting with us first or second time, we would love to have a record of your attendance and just get some uh, contact information from you. So if you wouldn't mind just uh, grabbing a, a Connect card there in the pocket in front of you, uh, fill that out so that we have a record of uh, uh, who you are so we can be in touch with you. Uh, we do not pass an offering plate here at North Citrus, uh, so if you want to give any gifts, you can do so uh, by placing your offering in any of the wooden boxes on either side of the auditorium or in the back. Um, also, there's an opportunity for our regular attenders and members uh, and anybody wants to give, there's a little QR code in the program. Uh, you can scan that. It'll take you to our website where it's securely and electronically. Uh, you can give a one-time gift or recurring gifts. Okay, so thank you for your gifts uh, to the church and, and the areas that are involved in that process. Okay, we also want to uh, let you know about ongoing uh, worship and uh, discipleship opportunities. Got our life groups up and running Sunday morning. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 6.30. Um, young adults meet uh, first and third. They've got a special event this week, so check with Sarah on that as far as any possibilities there. But uh, meeting here, uh, first and third, but special event this week. Okay. Yeah, we're going to eat at Culver's. Oh, so well, then that's a special event. At 6.30. So if you're a young adult and you want to get together and meet some other friends, eat at Culver's. Okay, and same time? Yes. 6.30. All right. So that sounds great. Okay. And then uh, please note, as we go into the summer months, uh, Citrus Youth uh, will uh, reconvene again uh, August 16th. So that's coming as we take a look. Next week, it is here already. We're going to go into the month of June. And so next week is our potluck. So please uh, keep that in mind. Uh, bring your favorite dish and join together for the potluck. And then as we are making plans for uh, Family Vacation Bible School, uh, there's some information on the table back there about On the Case. Um, and this is a uh, seeking out a detective theme, looking for the mystery of Christ. That's going to be happening July 23rd uh, through the 26th. And I encourage you to be a part of that. If you're interested in volunteering and helping us out, again, meeting next week right after church, okay? So lots of things going on. Um, we do want to give you an update on the patio project, okay? So many of you have uh, given some funds already. We're going to give you an update as to what's going on, how that's kind of uh, growing, developing, and the work that's going on. So Tom's going to give you an update on that um, right now. Thank you. Um... So where are we at here? Thank you. Uh, so a little bit update. Um, patio project is in order and is, is going along fine. I want you to keep in mind we do have a lot of strange birds and different people kind of keeping an eye. And I'd like for you to just try to be safe when you're out and when you're taking a look. There are some holes and things like that we've tried to barricade off and try to keep safe. Um, the uh, project supervisor, Mr. Sherman Fox, um, is always out keeping a watchful eye. And he does hide sometimes, and as you can tell, he, he kind of a little sneaky there, isn't he? Um, we started out uh, trying to save some sod we have out there and put it around various places that, you know, where we needed some rather than purchasing sod. And we were able to take care of a lot of that out of this, where the sidewalk's going to be. And then from there, a uh, contractor moved in, leveled in this area, and... Uh, there, we're taking some measurements so we can find things down the road. Anytime you ever bury something and couldn't find it, okay, it's real. If you make measurements of where you put it, and for goodness sakes, in Florida, don't use a tree because trees disappear overnight. It seems like it's crazy. Um, there, I was working on a sundial experiment. Didn't work out very well, so we're not going to put a sundial in. But we are going to have some drainage pipes and some water supply and things like that. Um, 
There we uh, tied in, just kind of showing you what we've got going on out there. Um, trying to have some extra things out there. Um, as you can see, it's kind of a, a, it's not that it's turned into something larger, it's just when you, as you plan something, you realize that there's other things that should be done and you can do. Of course, at least a little bit extra expenditures, so that is still going on, so if you can um, donate a little bit extra help. It, we're not gonna like buy everything, including the kitchen sink, but when you realize it would be nice to be able to take care of dishes and things like that outside that are really a mess, or if you're cooking, the sink can be nice too. So, um, you want me to go ahead and open, open with prayer? Okay, I'll have prayer before we, uh, before we start our worship service. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this blessed and wonderful Sunday morning. Lord, you watch over us, you guide us, you direct us, you take care of us so many different ways, Lord. We thank you so much for this Memorial Day weekend, Lord, and as we remember Christ who died for us, Lord, I pray that we would also take some time and, and remember others that have sacrificed for us so that we could have a country that's free and, um, and we would remember to show love to each other, Lord. We thank you so much for your kindness and your graciousness, and I pray that you'd be with the worship team as they go to, as they go to, um, put, help our hearts be in the right in the right place, Lord, and and uh, be with Joe as he gives us a message, and be with all those involved. In your sense, then we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start off our worship with a song called "Hymn for the Nation." So, if you'd like to stand, please stand, and whether standing or sitting, sing along with us. As we sing songs, get our hearts focused on God. God bless America, heal our broken land. God bless America. With your outstretched hand, we turn our eyes to you. We turn away from sin. We humbly call upon your name and ask you once again. God.
can separate even if I ran away your love never fails I know I still make mistakes but you have new mercies for me every day your love never God. 
God will find our home. The wonders of your love will break the chains that bind us. The power of your touch releases us to worship. Sing out to God. Sing hallelujah with all we are. We will worship you. Holy is your name. Holy is your name, O oh God. Together we'll live the name of Jesus. Together we'll sing of your great love. We will join with the angels to praise you. May our voices be pleasing to you, God. The wonder of your love will break the chains that bind us. The power of your touch releases us to worship. Sing out to God. Sing hallelujah. With all we are, we will worship you. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God 
seated. Good morning, everybody. I really didn't know how I was going to open this message. Uh, one, I started uh, six months ago when a lot of things popped up that really disgusted me. And we had two lead-ins for me this morning. The first song, God Heal Your Country, and our Bible study. Uh, I have a teacher in here. She was talking about the class and how bad things were with some of the students, how undisciplined and everything they were. And just thank you for everything. This is kind of help you where I was going. This meditation, like I said, I started out about six months or so ago. I was coming home. I don't know where I was, but Tracy called me and told me about the invasion of the White House. And I thought, you're kidding. That can't be happening. Not in this country. But it did. Here we are fighting with our fellow Americans with people being killed. And then right after that, FBI served President Trump um, subpoena at the Mar-a-Lago Resort. Consequently of that, there were several threats against the FBI. You see it still now, it disgusts me, all these bumper stickers, I call them, and garbage, is slamming both political parties. And this is my opinion. Our elected officials are voting for what is best for them and their own parties, and not what is best for the God in our country. Another thing that I've run into, people do not, used to be proud with a Democrat or Republican. They don't want to talk about it anymore because you can get shot for claiming to be whatever party it is. And each and every day seems to be getting worse in this country. It's scary, isn't it? Shootings are now common. Um, most shootings don't even make the news anymore, even the mass shootings. In Matthew 24, 4 through 7, it says, For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see, too, that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Thus said, is this a real issue to be focused on now? What we need to be focused on is the lost. Romans 10, 14 and 15, and I mentioned this in class, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in, and how can they not believe, or how can they believe in the one to whom they have not heard, and how can they hear without someone preaching to them? How many do we know that are not Christians that we see on a regular basis? We can do a little seed planting, watering, and fertilizing as we talk with each and every one of them. It doesn't have to be preaching or anything, just they give you an opening, jump. Looking back in my life, I know it does work. I think every elder and deacon from the First Church of Christ in Owasso, Michigan, and as a large church, came to see me, a lot of seed, a lot of water, and a lot of fertilizer was dumped on me but it worked and uh, consequently they came on the worst day we garden farm we had 56 acres of garden crop friday was our busiest day getting ready for market and that was the day they wanted to and boy they were friendly and nice and i, I had a hard time being friendly and nice when i had so much to do but this is what i have a point i'm making when problems in my life came that might have been what made me turn to christ Acts 8, 4, those who have been scattered, I'm pre talking about all those deacon and elders, preached the word everywhere they went. Believe me, they did. And Acts 8, 26 through 40, the angel of the Lord sent Philip to the desert road to meet an Ethiopian, 
Enoch, trying to understand Isaiah 53, 7, and 8. Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As a result, Enoch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in my way to be baptized? This was the beginning of the word being spread, quote, unquote, to the ends of the earth. I just hope and pray we are ready, available, and willing when God calls us. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. If Christ had not died for all of us, none of this would really matter at this point. But since he did give his all for us, let's give our lives to try and help our brothers and sisters and friends uh, to find Christ. Ending, if you don't like the world as it is today, let's change it, leading the world to Christ, one by one, if necessary. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, this country, I know it's been bad, and it's always bad, but it seems to be the trend, it seems to be getting worse as Satan takes control. I pray that you be with the country, I pray that you will empower the people of this church and other churches to go out and talk to people, and the only way we can make a difference is to make a difference in the people, bringing them to Christ. I pray this in your holy son's name, amen.
being able to properly identify plants and trees is a very important skill to have, but it is quite difficult unless you're one of those geeky horticulturist types who knows how to identify plants by like the leaf shape and the bark and all that kind of stuff. Um, those people are in a special category of people I envy because they can identify all kinds of stuff. For the rest of us, it is a little bit more difficult. Now, I myself am quite sensitive to poison ivy, and so I need to be aware when I'm in the woods what plants are poison ivy. Now, poison ivy is a very tricky plant because there are many different leaf shapes. Right? I just know that if it has a serrated edge on it, it's not poison ivy. But poison ivy can look like different things, like oak leaves or just like these other little smooth glove kind of leaves. Like they can be a shrub, they can be a tree-ish thing, they can be a vine, like all kinds of different things. So the woods want to make me itch. And so it's, it's important for me to be able to identify that. Maybe you're out hiking in the woods somewhere, uh, or maybe there's a total collapse in society. I don't know, I've watched too many movies and TV shows, and sometimes those are some of the plots of the movies, like everything just falls apart. And you might have to forage for food. If you were to do that, how would you know what is safe to eat? Or what tree, if you need to cut down a tree for some firewood or for shelter, like, which is a safe tree to do that to? It's important to know these things uh, sometimes because uh, you might, your life might depend on it. Um, now, some of those are just worst case scenarios, but identifying plants and, and different things is hard. But what is a surefire way to identify a plant besides its leaf shape and its bark and all that kind of stuff? What is a really easy way of identifying a particular plant or a tree? It starts, the, the process begins with pollen and flowers and it leads to producing fruits. Yes, okay. So in my readings of poison ivy, it's like, you know, at certain times of year, it produces this fruits. Okay, so what if I'm hiking in the woods and it's not that season, right? So I'm not gonna go on that. But a really easy way of identifying a plant is by its fruit, the things that it produces. So we're going to do a little bit of a quiz today, and I'm going to show you some fruits, and I want you to tell me what kind of tree produced that fruit. In English, we're kind of, uh, the, the, the common names are often the same as the, the fruit. This. What, what, kind of, what kind of tree produces this? An apple tree. If you eat that, you won't have to go to the doctor. Do I believe that? No. <laughs> this is the reusable bag tree. Thank you very much, Tom. <laughs> what about this? Grapefruit is the fruit. What kind of tree is it? <laughs> Grapefruit tree. OK. Oh gosh, that one's kind of gross. All right, what is this? How do you, how can you, how can, how can you tell that's a banana? How, that might look like a plantain. What kind of tree produces a banana? Banana tree. Knock, knock. Orange. No, no, banana, sorry, never mind, I messed up the joke. Okay. What kind of tree produces this? <laughs> it's not from a tree. It's from a plant. And I've never seen a pineapple grow, but I hear it like it shoots up this little stem from the top, and it like has a little tiny pi pineapple on the top of it. So they don't grow on trees. They kind of grow up from the ground, and they're kind of cool. But you know it's a pineapple because the fruit that it's making on the top looks like that, but tiny. right? So you can identify, you get the point here, you can identify a, a plant, a tree, by the fruit that it produces. And sometimes that is going to require a little bit of patience to wait and see what kind of fruit that is. And that's kind of obvious. We get that. Now, in Luke chapter 6, we read that Jesus says, For there is no good tree that bears bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree that bears good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. It's easy to recognize a, a tree by the kind of fruit that it makes, either good fruit or bad fruit. But Jesus is using this as an analogy to help us determine if a person is genuine in their faith. 
And so what fruit shows that a person has genuine faith in Jesus? Or you might personalize it and say, what fruit demonstrates that I have genuine faith in Jesus? Well, we're going to be looking at that in Galatians chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open that up. That's kind of towards the end of the Bible after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's uh, Acts, Romans, there's some smaller little books in there. Uh, you can find Galatians there, Galatians chapter 5. To give you a little bit of context about what's going on in this, uh, with this letter that Paul is sending out to the church in Galatia, there had been, uh, well, the church in Galatia was started, it was predominantly Gentile. That means most of the people there were not Jewish, that they were from a Greek or Roman background. Uh, but there had been people who were traveling around insisting that Christians who became Christians from being Gentiles, that they also have to follow the law of Moses. The law of Moses is written down in uh, Deuteronomy and Leviticus, uh, all kinds of different commands and requirements there. Uh, these things include all the sacrifices, the different offerings that they had to make, the fact that you cannot have mixed fiber. So if you have cotton polyester or cotton uh, spandex pants that are kind of stretchy uh, denim, like you're, you're out. Or if you cut the, the hair on the side of your head, guys, if you cut the hair on the side of your head, um, you're also out. Like, that is against the, the, the Levitical law. Um, they also had to, like, follow the year of Jubilee and all kinds of different requirements. Well, the men had to be circumcised and all that kind of stuff. So it was, some of these things were kind of painful. And so they were going around saying that if, even if you're not Jewish, you still have to follow the Jewish way of life. But leading up to this chapter, Paul has argued extensively that Christians are no longer obligated uh, to follow the law of Moses. They are free from all of those commandments and meticulous details and, and sacrifices and all that. He gives many different reasons, including the fact that Jesus has fulfilled the law. He's fulfilled all the requirements of the law. He shows how the law was just temporary to get us ready for Jesus, to lay the groundwork for him to arrive into this world. Um, and the fact that Jesus has instituted a new agreement between us and God. The, the old agreement between Moses and the people of Israel, that, that is no longer um, in place because Jesus has instituted a new agreement through his blood by sacrificing himself on the cross. Um, so he has created a new agreement between us and him that is based on faith and grace and not our ability to be good enough under the law. And so you might think, and, and Paul is going to address this, that if we are no longer bound by the Old Testament law, that means we are free to do whatever we want. And so he raises the concern that some people might take this freedom too far and they can do whatever it is that they want. They, they have a desire, they go and fulfill that desire. Since we are not bound by the Old Testament law, that means that we can go and do whatever we want, right? Right? Like, we don't have to do those things. We're not obligated by those moral standards, so we can do whatever pleases us, right? Well, Paul goes on in uh, verse 13 of Galatians chapter 5 and says this, For you were called to freedom. You're no longer bound by the law. You're no longer bound by sin, brothers and sisters. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. And so the short answer to this objection or this concern that people might raise is no. Yes, we are free from the law, but our freedom is not an excuse to indulge our fleshly appetites and sin. Because at the root of it, if everybody goes and does whatever they want, inevitably, that is going to lead to them mistreating other people because they will use other people as a means to get what they want or they will see something that somebody has and they will want it because their flesh wants it and they will go and take it from that person. And so selfishness inevitably leads to harming other people. Right? There, there's no such thing of a, as a sin that doesn't hurt anybody else. It is going to hurt somebody else no matter what. And so that's kind of why he talk, brings up this whole aspect of 
loving our neighbor as ourselves. The whole Old Testament law can be summarized in that command. That it's not about selfishness, it's about other people. So take, for example, in our country, we, we uh, love the fact that we have the freedom of speech, which gives uh, the, the First Amendment, which, which gives us freedom of speech, freedom uh, to practice religion, uh, th those sorts of things, freedom of the press. And we are, we are so glad that we have that. But some people will use that freedom of speech to insult others and put them down. And they will say, well, it's a free country. I can say whatever it is that I want, even though they are harming other people with their words. But we understand rightly that the First Amendment is not a license to be a jerk, that there are, there are moral responsibilities that come with that freedom of speech, that we don't use it just willy-nilly to hurt other people, but we, we do it to, uh, to, to speak the truth, even when that's, that truth is inconvenient and disliked by powers at that be. Right? So it's not a license to be a jerk. We all understand that. Yes, you can say whatever you want, but there are also some consequences socially that other people might impose on you, like a beat down in the corner, uh, for saying things, and I don't condone violence, but there are just some realities of the fact. Right? So we, there is no excuse. And, and Paul goes on to say, like, you can, if you bite and devour, if like, you keep fighting and, and seeking after your own uh, personal desires, like, it is just going to lead to chaos and people beating up on each other. Right, so freedom, yes, we're free, but that doesn't mean that our freedom is an excuse for sin. So our freedom is not to be used as an excuse to indulge our fleshly appetites and sin. So Paul goes on to say in verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And so he gives us an alternative, right? We could be tempted to follow the law as our means of our path in life, or we could be tempted to follow our fleshly appetites as a thing that, that guides our, our, our lives. But instead, he says that we are to follow the leading of the Spirit, that the Spirit is to guide our paths. He is to shape our lives and our choices and everything that we do. Because we know that the, the Holy Spirit is going to uh, guide us to eternal life with God. He's going to guide us and develop maturity in us. He's going to set us free from sins. Right? That is, those are the good things that the Spirit is going to bring in our lives. But the flesh only leads us to rebellion and destruction. It might promise some short-term benefits, some short-term pleasures, some short-term endorphin rushes, but in the end it is just going to let us down and it is going to cause more problems in our lives. And so you might ask right, uh, correctly, rightly, that, okay, so how do you know if you are following the leading of the flesh or following the leading of the Spirit? Well, Paul goes on and tells us in verse 19. He says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evidence, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of all of the deeds of the flesh, the things that our flesh causes us to do, because humans are really good at inventing evil, which is really just kind of like a repeat, uh, and we, we, we may recreate things that have already been created. Like, we're really good at, at doing evil in new ways. Um, so this is not an exhaustive list. So he says uh, things like this, right, because it, it doesn't end here. But we can kind of group these categories, or these things, into four different categories, because there's a lot, and it's kind of broad. They can be categorized by sexual sins, idolatry, social sins, means sins that we do uh, in regards to other people, and then sins of excess. So following in these things constitutes ongoing rebellion against God. And so this is an important list that Paul brings up and is important for us to look at before we even start talking about the fruit of the Spirit 
Because this is like a good, not, not necessarily a checklist, but it's good self-evaluation to see, am I really following the flesh or following the spirit? What am I following? Right? And so it's important that you think about, okay, um, have I done any of these things? And this is a really good, in, important time of honesty. Because just think about your life. How many of you have not struggled with the, any of these in the last seven days? Or in the last seven minutes? All right? That was 11.09. Have you done any of these since 11.09? Okay, um, if we are honest, we will realize that maybe I have. You might not be carousing, which is you know, a fancy word of going out and just doing whatever you want, uh, but you might be envying your friend's truck. You know, he's got some nice rims, you know, some nice underlighting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, it might be a $80,000 truck, and you're like, I really want that truck. Um, you, might, you might not be you know, doing some of those things, but you might be stirring up drama or dissensions, you know, causing people to be divided against each other, or factions. Now, uh, we heard that during the, the communion meditation this morning that the fact that we have politics and things are just so divided in our country. So uh, when it comes to election time uh, next year, we're going to see the, the, the factions thing really play out, right? We get divided and we fight each other just because they're on the opposite team. Like, this isn't football. This is real life with real life consequences. And so we're going to end up putting ourselves into different parties, and then we're going to argue about things hard-headedly, and just, just because the other side says something, like, our party might have used to agree on that thing, but because that party now agrees on it, we can't agree on it anymore just because it's them. You know, we just do those kinds of things, and we cause all kinds of factions and divisions. Or maybe you have outbursts of anger. Like when you're in traffic, traffic around here is getting worse, which I can agree with that. So there are people who are cutting you off more, or not turning their turn signal on, and they're just breaking, and you're like, why are you doing that? Um, or maybe the, when the restaurant messes up your order, there's a little bit of rage that happens there. Um, he also talks about witchcraft. You're like, well, I don't, I don't dress up with a pointy hat and a broomstick and, and those sorts of things. I'm okay. Now, when, 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 he, talk, when he talks about witchcraft, uh, the things that he's talking about, the, the Greek word there is pharmakia. Sound familiar? The pharmacy? So uh, back in that day, what they meant about witchcraft was doing drugs and making potions. Which if you talk about people who engage in essential oils, <laughs> it sounds a lot like witchcraft. You mix this oil and you mix that oil and it will cure all of your ailments. Or it will curse your neighbor. Like, I don't know, like... I'm joking, joking. So all of these things are like this banana. These things, are, well, okay, so pretend like this is even more rotten than it is. Uh, you know, you don't want to eat rotten fruit because it might make you sick. There might be maggots and things like that in there. So you don't want to eat it. It will cause problems. And so all of these things, these things are going to destroy fellowship and ruin lives because they're rotten and they're no good and they will just make you sick. And so this is a really obvious statement. It's a bad idea to let fleshly impulses guide our lives. They might seem fun for a moment, but eventually they'll cause all kinds of problems in our lives. Broken relationships, uh, illnesses, early death, all those sorts of things. So that's what, this is what kind of what looking, uh, following the flesh looks like. But what about following the Spirit? Paul goes on in verse 22 to say, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And if we live by the, by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit as well. So Paul gives us all of these characteristics of what it looks like when we are following the Spirit in our lives. And he makes a really important uh, point that the Spirit gives us life. That when we are immersed into Christ and we are given the Holy Spirit, our, our soul, we experience a rebirth in our soul. So the Spirit gives us life. Because he has done that, we ought to follow him every day of our lives and, and, and follow him. Let him guide our, 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 our walk. And so these are the, the different characteristics that the Spirit is going to grow in our lives the more time 
that we spend with God. But does fruit come on a tree or on a plant overnight? Can you plant a blueberry bush and the next day there are blueberries? Generally not, unless you got it from the nursery and it's already pre-grown. Like, there's always exceptions to the rule. But no, <laughs> it does not happen. It takes time. Fruit production takes time and patience. Did I not? Okay, there it is. Fruit production takes time and patience. Oftentimes they come, come about from us failing or being stretched beyond our limits, or being put through some hardship that is going to grow us in one of those areas or another. Like, if you ask for patience, God's going to give you kids. It's just how it's going to happen. Or grandkids, or neighbors. You know, whatever. You know, there's always those things. That you don't, these things don't just happen. It's, an op, it, it takes, it's a process. Um, but it takes time. Now, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to go on a mission trip in the Philippines. And when we were there, they talked about a, not a hurricane, a typhoon that had gone through not long before. And they were talking about the, the different uh, crops that they have, like pineapple and mango. And, and they were saying that it takes two to three years. It takes two years for uh, pineapple, two to three years for mango. And the typhoon had come and wiped out all of the, the mango trees and all of the pineapple plants. And so you lost a year or two, and then they're going to have to wait a year or two, or two years, three years for that, that crop. And so it is very devastating because the, it takes time for the fruit to bear. Or Harry was talking about these fruit trees that he planted in his yard, and they take seven years or so for them to begin to produce fruit. Right? It takes a long time for these fruits to grow. So, it, but that also presents a challenge, right? There's some more self-evaluation that happens as we consider this list. Uh, because if we have not been growing in any of these areas, or if you look back on your life with Jesus and you don't see much improvement, if you don't see any buds coming on the tree, if you don't see some little mini pineapples growing in your life, then that might be a sign that you are not living according to the Spirit, that you've been living according to the flesh. But conversely, like, it is oftentimes really encouraging to, to think, okay, I've been walking with Jesus for this long. I can look back five years, ten years, fifteen years, and I can see that there is a huge difference in my attitude, in my actions. And you can look and see that, yes, this is awesome, that the Spirit has been growing His fruit in my life. It hasn't always been easy, but I can see His work in, in my life over a long period of time. And so it's, it's good to... to have some self-evaluation. Look, is the Spirit working? I mean, the Spirit is working. Is there fruit? Because I'm not following the Spirit. Now, I want to make another observation about this before we move on, and that is um, the fruit of the Spirit, are, these are not just characteristics. The apple is red and, and yellow and greenish. The, this isn't just like an orangish yellow color. Like, those aren't just things that used to describe but the fruit of the Spirit are also attributes that we live out. The fruit of the Spirit causes us to act. They're not just attitudes and emotions, but they are characteristics that the Spirit empowers us to live out. They are to be implemented in our lives. So Paul goes on in verse 26 to say this, Let's not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. So as he describes the list of the fruit of the Spirit, he says, don't do this. Don't boast. Don't be challenging another one, another one, that, uh, one another. That's like, um, meet me out in the parking lot. Or, you know, th those kinds of things. Like argumentative, mean-spirited, can't get along kind of thing. We're envying one another. Like, don't do that. So he's telling us what not to do. So what should we do? What is the right course of action? Now, we already read this, so he's kind of bookending it. So he introduced the concept of what we should do at the beginning, and then he says, don't do that, because this is the opposite of that. So we find out in verse 13, he said, you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use, turn your freedom and opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Serving one another through love. So instead of treating one another badly, we are to serve one another 
in love. That means that we are to use our talents, our resources, our time, everything that we have to help other people on a personal one-on-one level. And let me be careful and let me be clear about this, that Paul is not talking about how we are to use our gifts to serve Jesus and his church. Those topics are covered elsewhere. Paul is saying that we have the responsibility individually, one-on-one, to serve one another in love with all the gifts and resources and the talents that we have. That we are to use who we are and what we have to bless and benefit other people. And all of us have some way that we can do that. Like, all of us have been gifted by God maybe to encourage somebody. Maybe you're positive and you're really good at encouraging people in their walk or helping them through hard times. Or maybe you have the financial resources to help somebody pay their bills or maybe get them a job because of your connections in the community. Or maybe you have the the ability to, to care for aging parents. Or maybe you have transportation to give somebody a ride to the doctor or to the airport or something like that. Maybe you have a kitchen table and you can invite somebody who's lonely over for dinner. Maybe you have the hope of Jesus and you find somebody in your life that is just hopeless and you can share that hope with them. So serving one another in love is the alternative to mistreating them. And so you can see what undergirds all of this. What characteristic undergirds, supports, and motivates the service that that Paul is commanding here? Love. And you notice that that was the first in the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this list that Paul gives is not in any particular order, except the first one is, I think, the principle that is undergirding the whole rest of the fruit of the Spirit. He begins a section by talking about how we are to serve one another in love. That is the key marker of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. That the, and we can think of it as the root, love is the root system for the whole tree, for all the fruit to have. If we don't have love, if we're not anchored in the love of God and love for others, then the other fruit is not going to be produced because a lot of those are geared and directed towards others. Now let's briefly define love. The Greek word there is agape, which we often describe, we often define as unconditional love. And that's, that's a basic way of explaining it, but that is kind of inaccurate in most settings. When you look at the, the, the dictionary definition of what it is, um, it doesn't necessarily mean unconditional love. Now, we do read in Scripture that God's love for us is not conditioned based on our sinfulness or how good or bad we are. Our love for one another is not supposed to be conditioned on how good or bad somebody is. In fact, we are told to love our enemies, which infers that they are bad and we're supposed to love them Anyway, so there is an aspect that love is unconditional. We're not supposed to condition our love based on whether or not we think somebody deserves it or not because none of us deserved it and God gave it to us anyway. But the problem is, if we just see agape as an unconditional love, and that's it, it leads us to a cold, obligatory love that is devoid of feeling. I love you because I have to love you. And so what what agape means is that we have warm affection for other people. We care about them and we want what is best for them. And then put into action, that is when we act in somebody's best interest because we care about them. So loving some way is acting in their best interest. Sometimes they don't want and sometimes we don't want to do it but it is something that is necessary for their well-being, right? And so sometimes when our kids, uh, they hurt somebody's feeling, they call them a name, or they hurt their sibling, oftentimes we tell the kid to say sorry. And then usually they say sorry. <laughs> and then you say, after they say it, say it like you mean it. Sorry, like you mean it. 
okay, sorry. Right? We're, we're trying to teach them that they are to actually care about the other person and care that they hurt their feelings. They, they care that did something about, they, they care that they did something to harm that other person. We're trying to teach them to care. Now, I think inadvertently we're teaching them to pretend like they care, but it's the beginning. Like we, I'm guilty, I'm a parent, right? So, but we want them to, to care, and we're trying to instill that value in them. Right? And so, uh, we are to love because we care, not just because we have to. So, if you don't care, um, you still have to act in, in their best interest. And eventually, the care will follow. Like, if you continue to act in love towards somebody, eventually, you're going you're gonna to love them. You're, those emotions are going to, to be there. But at the core, you love Jesus and you want to please Jesus, and so you will love the people and the things that Jesus loves. And also, if you recognize, you know, I don't really love that person, I'm going to love them anyway, that means that maybe the Spirit was going to grow that fruit in your life. And that could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe you just don't like the person, they rub you the wrong way, or maybe you're just a little ambivalent to them, or apathetic. But God will grow the fruit. So what fruit shows that a person, what fruit shows that you have a genuine faith in Jesus? Healthy fruit demonstrates genuine faith. Or healthy, love-filled fruit demonstrates genuine faith. Not like maggot-infested fruit, but fruit that is filled with love. And so if you lack love, if you're, you're hearing this and you're like, you know, I kind of lack love, uh, follow the Spirit and let Him build love in your heart. Read Philippians chapter 2. Uh, maybe if maybe it's because you're looking at them and you're seeing all the specks in their eye and you have this huge log coming out of your own eye, maybe see what logs are in your eye and, and uh, deal with your own sins and, and repentance first. And then maybe reflect on passages of Scripture about love. But most important, spend a lot of time with God in prayer. Spend time with the Spirit. Let Him shape that, bring that fruit in your life. And so if your love is abundant, you're like, you know, I'm really showing, showing that fruit in my life. I'm seeing a lot of people. I'm able to love people with my life. I'm able to encourage them and do good things for them. Like, let that fruit keep growing. Don't stop growing it. Don't say, like, I've grown enough fruit. Like, let that fruit keep growing in your life. So letting the Spirit mold our hearts to love is important. But even more important is letting the Spirit guide us to live out that lives that live out that love in very practical ways, and this requires the Spirit's power and our action. Now, living out living out the love of Christ is very, very important. Jesus said it's actually one of the chief signs, one of the chief fruits that the world is going to know that we follow Jesus and that we love Him, and that we love one another. In John chapter 13, Jesus said, I am giving you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world will see the fruit of love and they will know that is a Christian. Those people are Christians. They love Jesus and they might want that fruit for their own lives. And so let's love one another well. Let's, uh, not just because we have to, but let us learn to care for others. And let us learn to desire what is best for them. And then let us do what we can to demonstrate that love through our actions. And so since we love Jesus, since we love one another, and since we want the world to know and follow Jesus, let's love well. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the love that Jesus has for all of us, that we are unworthy of, that even while we were your enemies and sinners, that he came to die for us, to forgive us our sins and, and give us eternal life with you. Father, I pray that you would help us all to develop that same fruit of love in our lives, that we would love others just as you have loved us, without condition, but also with emotion and care and concern for them. So help us to find practical ways to love people in our lives, to serve them through love with the gifts and abilities and resources and the personalities that you have given to us. And Father, I also pray for anybody here today who has heard about your love and they want to accept your love and have their sins washed away. 
and, and have eternal life with you. I pray that they would do so today, that they would submit to you in baptism and allow you to wash their sins and give you eternal life. And Father, for all of us, I pray that you would help us to evaluate our lives and see where we stand in our fruit versus the flesh and help us to better follow you each and every day of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So at this time, we're going to sing our invitation song, and we invite you to respond to the message that you have heard, to respond uh, to God's love, his invitation to join his family and have your sins washed away. So if you want to give yourself to your life to Jesus and allow him to do that for you today, come forward during this time as we stand and sing our song, Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I, love lifted me. Let's take some time, if we could. If you could save that second verse, I want to go ahead and uh, take uh, Annette here. Um, very thrilled with the decision that she has made uh, to give her life to Jesus Christ. And uh, she uh, had uh, some upbringing early on as a child, but didn't have a chance to make that decision for herself uh, to be immersed into Christ. And now she has come and said, I want to follow on God's uh, commands and the biblical guideline to be immersed into Christ and be baptized. So here in just a few minutes, you are going to witness um, a baptism here. Uh, so yes, that's right. That's right. Give her a round of applause by all means. Come on down the front. We've got the Citrus kids coming in. And uh, they're going to witness this as well and take in this event. Um, Annette, I'm going to ask, uh, is there... I know this has been working on your heart for, for some time. Is there any specific thing that you just want to maybe share with the, the congregation as to what brought you to this decision? Um, actually reading about it in the Bible and knowing that what the real, I never made that choice. And so now I'm ready. Okay. You know, a lot of times we don't make choices as to what church we grow up in or what our past experience it is. But as we go back to the scriptures, that's where we find our connection. And uh, she has read the scripture and walked through that. She sees that God has commanded to uh, be baptized into Christ, to be immersed. That it's a choice that you make um, to give your life to Christ, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and receive the forgiveness of sins. So we're going to do that today. Okay? I'm going to ask that you uh, take my right hand and you repeat after me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I accept him. And I accept him. And confess him. And confess him. As Lord. As Lord. And Savior. And Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, let's give her a big round of applause. And we're going to step back and uh, get ready uh, while we go on singing. Anybody else that wants to make any decisions? Uh, that invitation's still open, okay? All right, we'll go from there. To him I give, ever to him I cling, in his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs, faithful loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Well, Y'all can go ahead and be seated. Um, Annette requested that 
uh, requested that we play a song for her uh, in preparation for her getting baptized. And so um, I just ask that as this, the song is being uh, played, listen to the words, reflect on it, uh, reflect on God and his love, um, reflect on uh, work, your own walk with, with Jesus and kind of let the song uh, speak to you. And then when she is ready, uh, Jonathan will, will take over from there. So, Tom. special song that Annette had requested that meant a lot to her in her personal walk with Jesus Christ. And folks, that's what it's all about. It's not about decisions that are made for you, or it's not about your background or your upbringing. 
It's ultimately about coming to know who you are before a holy God and standing before Jesus Christ and accepting the sacrifice that he gave upon the cross of Christ for our sins and saying, I want to submit myself to Christian baptism and I want to give my life to him. And so today, Annette, you're being baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Rejoice in Annette's decision today to submit to Christ in baptism and obedience to uh, Scripture. We're so encouraged by her faith and her decision today. Uh, continue to pray for her and for her walk with Jesus um, and maybe reflect on what decisions Jesus might be calling you to live uh, in your life as well. Let's go ahead and stand and have a word of prayer and then we will be dismissed today. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful uh, for the opportunity to gather and worship uh, you today. Uh, we're so grateful for the love that you have for each and every one of us. I pray that as we depart from here today, that we would be able to show your love uh, to whoever we come into contact with, especially those who need to hear your love, or especially those that you send into our lives that we need to show your love to. Um, I pray for Annette, and I thank you so much for her decision, that you laid that on her heart and guided her to that decision. I pray that you would continue to bless her walk and continue to grow fruit in her life and the lives of her family. Um, and I pray that for all of us, that we would follow you, follow your spirit, follow your leading, that we too might bear fruit. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.